Hello, my dear student friends. It gives me immense pleasure to meet you through this online mode for the paper Shakespeare, which is offered to you as a third allied paper in your third semester for your second BA English program. So, as I am one among the course teachers for this paper, I am once again very happy to start sharing with you a small introduction to the great literary giant William Shakespeare. So, as students of literature, you might be already familiar with Shakespeare and for this allied paper, let me begin with a small introduction first and then we can go by unit wise. So let's get into the presentation. So for this paper, in this presentation, I would like to discuss the following objectives first and then we can move from one slide to the other. So for this paper, the topics we are going to cover are first a general introduction to the Elizabethan age, number two, Elizabethan theatre and its conventions, life and works of Shakespeare, a brief outline, Shakespearean tragedies, Shakespearean comedies and finally we have a provision for questions or some topics for discussion. And in the last slide I have also given references and a platform for discussion. So let's get into the presentation. Okay students, in the first slide, let us begin with a general introduction to the characteristics of the Elizabethan period or the Elizabethan age. During this period of Queen Elizabeth I, that is between 1558 to 1603, England became a unified and a glorious country. Trade and commerce flourished. So there was economic prosperity and there was it was an age of abundance. So as this age also falls under renaissance which means rebirth. Renaissance can be defined with a term called rebirth which refers to the revival of the learning of classical literature or classical literary works. This age is called as an age of exploration and people had quest for knowledge. They wanted to question everything. All the accepted or the so-called conventional beliefs were questioned and challenged. So England emerged as a political superpower and a dominant force under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. In, in London remained the largest city in European continent. So as far as literature is concerned, the theatres in London were located on the Bishop of Canterbury's land and remember the theatre or the drama, drama profession was not considered to be a very decent one. So theatres were not allowed to function along with the cities. So apart from the city that is London, on the other side of the river, on the other bank, theatres were established and the land belongs to the Bishop of Canterbury. The theatre houses or the playhouses were surrounded by notorious places like brothels, pubs and gaming houses. In that period, gambling was quite common. And people also indulged in some notorious games like bear baiting, cock fights and tournaments. And they were held in the same space where the original theatre was performed. Okay, when we get into the introductory part for the Elizabethan theatre, as I already mentioned, they were located in courtyards and larger homes of lords and other noble patrons. They have to perform in their homes 
as a means of entertainment whenever the lords or other noblemen demand in, in a form of entertainment the people the actors have to perform a play that was the case and theaters were no longer supported by the government as well as by the church and the performances were held 6 days in a week continuously and there were no shows on sundays that is on the sabbath day the dramatic performances were held only during the afternoon that is between 2 to 5 pm with no lighting provisions so before sunset the plays were about to be completed and the drama managers they often keep on changing the plays so that the audience get a variety of plays being staged on them and in order to make an announcement or to let the people know what kind of play was being shown or staged they made use of flags on the top of the play houses for example a black flag is hoisted to symbolize or to announce that a tragedy is being staged and a white flag is meant for comedies and the red flag denotes a history play so with this method the audience come to know that what kind of play is being staged and at a time in a season a single play was performed up to even 10 times and another important feature was women or young girls were not allowed to play their roles on the stages for women characters men played those roles or especially boys young teenage boys or effeminate men they were allowed to perform on the stages by taking on the roles of women as i already mentioned acting was not considered a decent profession so only men were allowed to play the roles of women characters in the plays and the first permanent theater was built in england by james burbage who is none other than the father of an actor and he constructed a structure called the theater and he gave the name called the theater and it resembled a structure of an amphitheater or a projection or a thrust style of theater in the to be performed in open air and as i already mentioned it was not considered to be a very respectable profession since english people were slowly moving towards a puritan a touch as far as the globe theater is considered it was the theater that belongs to the group in which shakespeare was also one among the managers and it was one of the famous most famous elizabethan theaters which was surrounded on three sides by a structure called galleries as you can see in the picture on the right corner there are three galleries available and which resembles a clear division for the classes of people first the people who were seated on the ground on the sand near close to the stage are called as groundlings and then in the first step of gallery we have a queens or kings and in the second step or the third step we have the noblemen the lords and the other rich people so globe theater is the one where shakespeare's troupe performed his plays and he was a part owner in the theater and the globe theater acting company had about 25 actors as i mentioned earlier they were all male members only half of the actors were already shareholders in the theater that is how the theater was run and some of the other contemporary playwrights along with shakespeare worth mentioning are sir walter raleigh christopher marlow edmund spencer these were all contemporaries of shakespeare and in this slide let us have a brief look at the outline or the blueprint 
of the Shakespearean theater. On the whole, the Shakespearean stage was 43 feet wide and it extended halfway into the yard that is about 27 and a half feet it was projected further. That is why it is called as an amphitheater structure. And as I mentioned earlier, we have three stories of galleries and they differ in their heights also. The first gallery is of 12 feet, second one is of 11 feet and the third one is of 9 feet in height. And they also had four separately divided gentlemen's rooms in order to change their costumes as well as to have their entrances and exits. The Globe Theatre could accommodate about 3000 people at a time. And as I mentioned about the groundlings who were seated near the stage on the ground, they were charged just one cent for getting admitted into the playhouse. And the higher prices are also for the galleries in which nobles and other lords are seated. There were also provisions for having private boxes for VIPs like kings and queens or other noblemen. Refreshments were also sold but there were no provisions for restrooms or no intermissions were given. The Globe Theatre was accidentally set into fire during a performance in 1613 and it was rebuilt somehow later in 1644 and before 1644 when the theatres were closed during the restoration period. So it's time to get into an introduction to the one of the greatest English playwrights William Shakespeare. As you are already aware he was born on April 23rd 1564 at Stratford upon Avon London in UK. He was the third child of eight children for his parents. Father was John Shakespeare. He was a businessman basically, a glove maker and a trader. He married, Shakespeare married a girl named Annie Hathaway in the year 1582 when she was 26 and he was 18. Together they had three children named Susanna and twins named Judith and Hamnet. On the whole, Shakespeare has written 37 plays, 36 complete plays, 37th is an incomplete one and he is also commonly popularly known for his 154 sonnets. Generally, we classify Shakespearean plays into histories, tragedies, comedies and tragic comedies. He died on the same day of his birthday that is on April 23rd on 1616. He was one among the members of the Lord Chamberlain's men which was later called with the title King's Men when James first uh, assumed our power and became the king in 1603. The early name was Lord Chamberlain's men which was led by James I and when he assumed office as the king, the Lord Chamberlain's men name was changed into King's Men and he performed at court 12 times a year. As I mentioned, Shakespearean plays can be classified broadly into history plays, tragedies, comedies and tragic comedies. I have given some examples for each category that is for history plays we have Henry the fourth and Henry the fifth Richard the second and third for tragedies I have mentioned the four major tragedies there are many tragedies but I have chosen only the four because these four tragedies are very famous and Shakespeare ironically was very famous not for his comedies or his tragic comedies or histories but he was very famous for his tragedies. Still, he is acclaimed as one of the greatest dramatists, not for his histories or comedies, but for his tragedies. So we have comedies like Twelfth Night, Much of the Bourne Opening, Taming of the Shrew, etc. We also have tragic comedies like All is Well That Ends Well, A Winter's Tale, etc. So I have listed out all the Shakespearean tragedies here for your reference. 
you can go through it antony and cleopatra coriolanus cymbeline hamlet julius caesar king lear macbeth othello romeo and juliet timon of athens titus andronicus troilus and cressida so before we get into the conventions of shakespearean tragedies it is imperative that we learn the definition for tragedies first a tragedy is a play that usually ends in death and violence death i mean the death of the central character himself not other characters some of the characters also die along with the central character but still usually in shakespearean tragedies the central character or the hero himself dies in the end and the plays are filled with brutality violence bloodshed and so on when aristotle talks about a term called catharsis a cathartic effect this effect is created in the minds of an audience while they witness a tragedy audience get their emotions affected by the feelings of pity and fear when we mean the term pity it is the outcome of the characters and yet at the same time we identify so closely with the central character that we started being feeling afraid fear comes in our minds that the same circumstances could also happen to us also so pity is evoked in the minds of the audience for the tragic hero for undergoing such pain suffering and death and at the same time we audience also undergo or also get a feeling of fear that if we violate the natural laws like the shakespearean tragic hero we may also end up like him we may also uh, suffer the same kind of pain the tragic hero has undergone so aristotelian tragedies they fix and emphasize more on moral values and choices what kind of choice the tragic hero makes and all the tragic heroes believe me they are very powerful characters they are extremely powerful and noble by character they all have principles they all live by principles and they die for their principles they are all steadfast people they are extremely bold courageous and very good fighters they are all men of noble birth they are men of nobility they live and die for their own principles they are highly principled men with noble values so when such people having or possessing such noble qualities suffer automatically the pity and fear gets evoked in our minds so tragedies emphasize how the character moves from one emotional state to another or one physical state to another for example in the case of othello we feel sympathetic to othello that is the main character but at the same time we admit we have to admit that he is responsible for the death of his wife because of suspicion and no other can be no other fellow can be blamed for that and uh, when you when we try to decipher shakespearean tragedies we need to understand a wheel of fortune that tragedies deal with innocent victims sometimes not in all the cases they also deal with innocent victims who are caught up in a tragic situation simply they do not deserve i am not talking about all the tragic heroes in general some heroes get into trouble or they get caught in a spider web of trouble and fortune acts as a wheel that goes up and down like in the case of romeo and juliet it is mostly the case of chance or the time or fate which makes them suffer and not the hero or the heroine him themselves and as we can define again a man of high standard the tragic hero is defined as a man of high standard who falls from that high standard because of a tragic flaw and aristotle calls it as a hamartia that has affected many so as i mentioned earlier a tragic hero is always a man of noble birth with noble virtues and a man of high standards 
he is a man of extreme courage and he is a great warrior too and a classical example is none other than macbeth himself he possesses all the conventional classical qualities of a conventional classical tragic hero in the end of the slide i have given a five act structure how a tragedy begins and ends in the beginning or the in the exposition part that is in act 1 all the major characters are introduced and then the action slowly gets intensified in starts uh, or to say the tension starts increasing and in the blue symbol the arrows which denote with blue you can see and that is the critical action in which there is the climactic part in that part climax takes place where the conflict is resolved usually in the process of resolution what happens is the hero meets his end so in the topmost emotional level in the climactic part what happens is the hero gets killed the hero loses his life and then the tension slowly gets down you can see in the five act structure and as in the case of uh, part 1 or act 1 the same kind of uh, situation you can see in act 5 that means the tension is over and everything comes to back to normal so let us get into some theatrical conventions now in tragedies also there are provisions for comic reliefs by fools or clowns in shakespeare shakespeare has introduced the fools and clowns not as a typical clown of the 21st century these fools and clowns are all witty fools and clowns they are highly intelligent people they always speak in a very philosophical tone they are not normal people they are not ordinary characters they are highly philosophical in nature they sometimes provide good advice to the tragic hero himself and next part is regarding uh, tragedies lot of violence takes place and most of the violence happens only in the off stage not on stage due to a lack of uh, theatrical devices and uh, due to uh, for the reason of avoiding violence and bloodshed on the stage uh, these uh, uh, acts of warfare uh, were shown only in an off stage right and then suicide is another important element in shakespearean tragedies in senecan tragic theory it is suicide is often considered to be a profound moral statement uh, and it is an what is it is not uh, considered to be an act of cowardice it is considered as a result of a moral corruption as in the case of lady macbeth which we are going to discuss uh, in detail or we come across a madness in the case of ophelia's character in hamlet in both the cases the church he considers suicide as a one of the deadly seven seven deadly sins it is an unforgivable unpardonable sin but as far as seneca is concerned considered seneca considers suicide to be a noble act it is not an act of cowardice and as i mentioned madness can be also seen as far as tragic heroes of shakespeare are concerned they suffer due to some emotional breakdowns they have some emotional problems they have some serious issues in their mental makeup as in the case of ophelia in hamlet or as in the case of hamlet himself uh, he feigns madness he pretends himself to be a mad fellow and that leads to the uh, ophelia's suicide out of her madness and next important element in shakespearean tragedy is the great chain of being so as far as the, uh, the royalty or the kingship is considered it should be never be challenged it should not be endangered and the authority must be held with high power and respect whenever the great chain of being is thwarted broken disturbed by some tragic heroes they have to face the severe punishment of undergoing death itself so at any cost the great chain of being should not be broken the tragic state 
the next element the tragic state is becomes irreversible in shakespearean tragedies because once the tragic heroes of shakespeare get into the tragic path they can never revert back to their original position of innocence of goodness they cannot recover at all they proceed further into the evil path and they never they can never return back to their original noble state the next important element is paying attention to contrasting foils in shakespearean tragedies it is an important element we come across so many contrasting characters typical contrasting characters can be noted in all major tragedies of shakespeare in the case of macbeth we have a noble character like banquo also we can also include banquo's son fleance so next we get into shakespeare's comedies let us begin with the definition first a comedy can be defined as a light hearted play with a happy ending usually ends with marriage or multiple marriages it is just an opposite for tragedy that means it is very light hearted in nature it is very comical in nature it deals with very less serious issues there is no much bloodshed violence or any warfare there will be small misunderstandings and there will be small conflicts within families and usually comedies end with marriage or marriages some of the comedies of shakespeare are listed as all is well that ends well as you like it the comedy of errors cymbeline love's labor lost the merry wives of windsor i have highlighted the merchant of venice which we are going to deal in the second unit a midsummer night's dream much ado about nothing pericles prince of tyre taming of the shrew the tempest toilers and cressida twelfth night two gentlemen of verona a winter's tale and measure for measure in this list of shakespearean comedies uh, i have uh, highlighted the merchant of venice because it doesn't fit into the classical definition of a shakespearean comedy because the merchant of venice deals with a very serious issue and it is worthy to be called as a tragic comedy okay let us move on to the other conventions of shakespearean comedies so young lovers trying to overcome the hardships and obstacles is one major element as i told you there are conflicts between lovers these conflicts and obstacles arise mainly due to the parents of or the elders of the lovers they don't easily approve the love affair of the pairs and problem comes as in the cases of all the plays of shakespeare fate chance also plays an important role and whatever problem goes on finally the lovers will get united and there will be a happy ending next important element is mistaken identity one of shakespeare's most favorite and most used plot devices is this mistaken identity and there is a huge amount of cross dressing even the lover or the lady love themselves cannot identify their own parts and this reels deals with mistaken identity they just get, get confused with the identity of their lovers and we also have gender mix ups as i told about cross dressing uh, girls wearing the costumes of men they masquerade as opposite sex and leads to many confusions and comical situations and we also have interesting or clever twists in plots audience keep on guessing what will happen next and whatever the twists are the ending will be a happy one and there is also a wide usage of puns and word play by shakespeare in all his comedies and these puns are are all witty language games which contain high philosophical value and uh, shakespearean comedies also have stock characters like the young couple the clowns the fool the clever servant the drunkards etc and usually these stock characters are meant for providing comic interludes comic gaps in order to 
make the play uh, a more jovial one or more humorous one and as i mentioned all shakespearean comedies will have happy endings which involve marriage or multiple marriages so in the introduction part is over as one among the course teachers of this paper shakespeare l3 ao3 i am going to handle two units unit 1 deals with the famous tragedy called macbeth and unit 2 is going to deal with a comedy that is a serious kind of comedy the merchant of venice for this presentation this that is the introductory part to shakespeare i have given you some six questions and you can go through these questions and you can take it as a present assignment so kindly go through these questions and try to refer some references make use of references i have given in the next slide you can go through it and just by clicking these references you can visit the websites and you can gather more details and points for further reading and i have also opened up a platform to raise your questions and clarifications and for that purpose you are instructed to join the google classroom by just making note of the class code i have given in the end of the slide hope you like this presentation and i am very sure that this introductory part for shakespeare will give you a a brief outline for understanding shakespearean plays thank you for your patient listening see you bye